Further, before you can speak peace to your hearts, you must not only be troubled for the sins of your life, the sin of your nature, but likewise for the sins of your best duties and performances. When a poor soul is somewhat awakened by the terrors of the Lord, then the poor creature, being born under the covenant of works, flies directly to a covenant of works again. And as Adam and Eve hid themselves among the trees of the garden and sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness, so the poor sinner, when awakened, flies to his duties and to his performances to hide himself from God, and goes to patch up a righteousness of his own. Says he, I will be mighty good now, I will reform, I will do all I can, and then certainly Jesus Christ will have mercy on me. But before you can speak peace to your heart, you must be brought to see that God may damn you for the best prayer you ever put up. You must be brought to see that all your duties, all your righteousness, as the prophet elegantly expresses it, put them all together are so far from recommending you to God, are so far from being any motive and inducement to God to have mercy on your poor soul that he will see them to be filthy rags, a menstruous cloth that God hates them and cannot away with them if you bring them to him in order to recommend you to his favor. My dear friends, what is there in our performances to recommend us unto God? Our persons are in an unjustified state by nature. We deserve to be damned ten thousand times over, and what must our performances be? We can do no good thing by nature. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. You may do many things materially good, but you cannot do a thing formally and rightly good, because nature cannot act above itself. It is impossible that a man who is unconverted can act for the glory of God. He cannot do anything in faith, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. After we are renewed, yet we are renewed but in part, Indwelling sin continues in us. There is a mixture of corruption in every one of our duties, so that after we are converted, were Jesus Christ only to accept us according to our works, our works would damn us. For we cannot put up a prayer, but it is far from that perfection which the moral law requireth. I do not know what you may think, but I can say that I cannot pray, but I sin. I cannot preach to you or any others, but I sin. I can do nothing without sin, and as one expresseth it, my repentance wants to be repented of, and my tears to be washed in the precious blood of my dear Redeemer. Our best duties are as so many splendid sins. Before you can speak peace in your heart, you must not only be made sick of your original and actual sin, but you must be made sick of your righteousness, of all your duties and performances. There must be a deep conviction before you can be brought out of your self-righteousness. It is the last idol taken out of our heart. The pride of our heart will not let us submit to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But if you never felt that you had no righteousness of your own, if you never felt the deficiency of your own righteousness, you cannot come to Jesus Christ. There are a great many now who may say, well, we believe all this, but there is a great difference betwixt talking and feeling. Did you ever feel the want of a dear Redeemer? Did you ever feel the want of Jesus Christ upon the account of the deficiency of your own righteousness? And can you now say from your heart, Lord, thou mayest justly damn me for the best duties that ever I did perform? If you are not thus brought out of self, you may speak peace to yourselves, but yet there is no peace. But then, before you can speak peace to your souls, there is one particular sin you must be greatly troubled for, and yet I fear there are few of you think what it is. It is the reigning, the damning sin of the Christian world, and yet the Christian world seldom or never think of it. And pray, what is that? It is what most of you think you are not guilty of, and that is the sin 
of unbelief. Before you can speak peace to your heart, you must be troubled for the unbelief of your heart. But can it be supposed that any of you are unbelievers here in this churchyard that are born in Scotland in a Reformed country that go to church every Sabbath? Can any of you that receive the sacrament once a year, oh, that it were administered oftener, can it be supposed that you who had tokens for the sacrament, that you who keep up family prayer, that any of you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I appeal to your own heart if you would not think me uncharitable, if I doubted whether any of you believed in Christ, and yet I fear upon examination we should find that most of you have not so much faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the devil himself. I am persuaded the devil believes more of the Bible than most of us do. He believes the divinity of Jesus Christ. That is more than many who call themselves Christians do. Nay, he believes and trembles, and that is more than thousands amongst us do. My friends, we mistake a historical faith for a true faith, wrought in the heart by the Spirit of God. You fancy you believe because you believe there is such a book as we call the Bible because you go to church. All this you may do and have no true faith in Christ. Merely to believe there was such a person as Christ, merely to believe there is a book called the Bible will do you no good, more than to believe there was such a man as Caesar or Alexander the Great. The Bible is a sacred depository. What thanks have we to give to God for these lively oracles? But yet we may have these and not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear friends, there must be a principle wrought in the heart by the Spirit of the living God. Did I ask you how long it is since you believed in Jesus Christ? I suppose most of you would tell me you believed in Jesus Christ as long as ever you remember. You never did misbelieve then you could not give me a better proof that you never yet believed in Jesus Christ, unless you were sanctified early, as from the womb. For they that otherwise believe in Christ know there was a time when they did not believe in Jesus Christ. You say you love God with all your heart, soul, and strength? If I were to ask you how long it is since you loved God, you would say, as long as you can remember, you never hated God. You know no time when there was enmity in your heart against God. Then, Unless you were sanctified very early, you never loved God in your life. My dear friends, I am more particular in this because it is a most deceitful delusion whereby so many people are carried away that they believe already. Therefore it is remarked of Mr. Marshall, giving account of his experiences, that he had been working for life, and he had ranged all his sins under the Ten Commandments, and then, coming to a minister, asked him the reason why he could not get peace. The minister looked at his catalogue. Away, says he, I do not find one word of the sin of unbelief in all your catalogue. It is the peculiar work of the Spirit of God to convince us of our unbelief, that we have got no faith. Says Jesus Christ, I will send the Comforter, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of the sin of unbelief, of sin, says Christ, because they believe not on me. Now, my dear friends, 